Well, Shabbat Shalom, welcome again. You know, this, I know in, online you didn't hear the music for a variety of reasons, but, um, you know, glory come down. That's what next weekend is going to be about, the full outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. We talked about, you know, kind of partial outpourings. Then in the upper room is the full outpouring. And then it talks about we're waiting for the sound of the returning of the king. And I hope it's tonight. Then we don't even have to worry about packing our stuff and moving. <laughs> Woo, wouldn't that be awesome? Every morning I get up and say, Lord, I hope you come today. But we'll see. So tonight, as another thing to prepare for Shavuot Pentecost, and if you're counting the Omer, it's going to be day 42 as soon as the sun goes down. So we don't have too many more days to wait. In fact, next next Friday night at sundown, we'll, I don't know if we'll still be here, but then it will officially be Shavuot, and the churches will celebrate it on Sunday. So that's awesome. But the Ruach, who is, if you saw the video that I advertised earlier, I just put it up today, so if I haven't seen it yet, it's kind of the Old Testament prefigurement of when the Spirit comes, what's going to happen. And it's through the eyes of David and Isaiah and Jeremiah and, and, and some of the, uh, Samuel and some of the others. You know, people say, well, the Holy Spirit's not mentioned in the Old Testament. Well, actually, he's mentioned a lot. And starts at the second verse of the whole scripture, Genesis 1-2, where it says the spirit hovered over the water. He brooded over the water. And the creation started to be organized. He was the prime mover of the creation. And Paul tells us about Yeshua and says that everything was made by him and through him and for him. And he talks about the father being the creator as Elohim, the creator. And of course we know that God operates in Trinity, he is Trinity, he's always been Trinity, always will be Trinity, was Trinity long before anything was created. Well, there was no before, because he's always existed. He's always been Trinity. There was never a time he didn't exist. You know, like we say, Yeshua wasn't born December, whenever he was born, but let's say he was born December 25th. It doesn't mean that's when he came into existence. He's always existed. When the Holy Spirit came Pentecost morning, it wasn't like, whoa, where did this come from? He has always existed. And we went over some of the things that he manifested in the Tanakh, the Old Testament. So today we're going to talk a little bit about what Yeshua, Jesus said about him. Because you know, if you read uh, John 14, 15, and 16, and please do that for your homework. Please read the scripture. I I can't even stand it anymore that nobody ever reads the scripture anymore. Please. This is like breathing and eating. Please read it. And in John 14, 15, and 16, it's actually at the Last Supper. The whole big chunk of John's gospel is actually at the Last Supper. And Yeshua, you know, it's the last Seder, like we've celebrated Seders. At that last Seder, he's describing so much and teaching them so much. Because in a very few hours, the sacrifice on the cross is going to take place. In a little bit longer, the resurrection on the Feast of First Fruits is going to take place. 50 days later, 50 days from that Sabbath, the day after he died, the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, is going to fall with an unlimited outpouring that was predicted in Joel chapter 2. Read that for your homework, too. Woo! Joel's a minor prophet, but man, chapter 2 is unbelievable. So John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Wow, the church has forgotten this. He doesn't say, eh, you know, if you love me, it's cool. You can do whatever you feel like doing. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit, capital S, of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, 
You know him because he dwells with you and will be in you. He's not just living here with us, he's in us. You know, when Jesus talks to the woman at the well, what a great passage. You know, he says, the time's already here when you don't have to worship just in Jerusalem or just on this mountain. You can worship wherever you are because the Father wants worshipers in spirit and in truth. So here he says, the spirit is, you're going to know him and he's going to live in you. So you can worship wherever you are. He's the spirit of truth. So he says, another helper. This is a paraclete. A paraclete is from the Greek word parakletos. That means somebody who stands beside you. It's an advocate. It can also mean a strong teacher. Somebody who stands beside you. Now, it's another paraclete because Jesus, Yeshua, also is a paraclete. The Son is sent. The Spirit is sent. The Father's never sent. But the Son is sent. The Spirit is sent. They're paraclete's. We know Jesus stands beside us because when you die, let's say he doesn't come back tonight. What a bummer. But if he doesn't come back tonight and I die tonight, I'm going to face my judgment, right? And God, in the sense of the Father, is going to say, you're a, you're a total disaster. You violated every law. You deserve hell. But Yeshua standing beside me as my paraclete, as my advocate, as my lawyer, says, but Father, I died for him, his sins forgiven by, by my blood. And the Father says, yes, I don't even see the sin. Come on in. No, he won't say come on in, but that'll be kind of the whole thing. So it's someone who stands beside you, another paraclete, and he's going to dwell in you. So, he, so Jesus, Yeshua, tells us here that by his intercession, the Father's going to send the Spirit. Now, you know, there's a big controversy. Y'all may know this, may not know this. But there's a big controversy between the Eastern Church and the Western Church about this. Because the Eastern Church, our Orthodox brothers and sisters, believe that only the Father sends the Holy Spirit. The Son does not send him. And if you read the original Nicene Creed, it says that the Spirit proceeds from the Father. Then later, the Western Church added, and the Son, and the people in the East went crazy. And that was one of the things that led to the schism, or schism, or schism, whichever you want to say. We're not going to get into that. I had a Greek Orthodox guy one day go off on me because he was telling me about this and how the Western Church were all a bunch of heretics because... They added the sun, and the sun can't send the spirit. I says, well, why can't the sun send the spirit? Well, he can't send the spirit, only the Father. So I said, well, when Jesus was in the upper room, and it says he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, what does that mean? And this guy went ballistic on me, started yelling at me, red face, veins in his head popping out. Then he called me a heretic. And I said, whoa, dude, relax. I'm just trying to understand where you're coming from. We wouldn't want to go out to lunch with that guy, believe me. <laughs> kind of reminds me of somebody else who used to hang around in my office, but we won't mention any names. <laughs> so the intercession of the Son sends the Spirit from the Father. So because of the work of the Son, the Spirit's poured out. We don't have time to put up every scripture, but Yeshua says, the Spirit can't come until I go. The Spirit can't come until I'm until the Son is glorified. Pentecost couldn't have happened two weeks before the cross, or two years before the cross, or the day of the cross, because Jesus had to die, he had to rise, he had to ascend back to the glory where he came from. So when the Son was glorified, then the Spirit is poured out. And he says, the world doesn't know the Spirit. That's pretty much true. I mean, a lot of people call the Holy Spirit the unknown member of the Trinity because nobody really talks about him. I mean, we do because we're Pentecostal charismatics. But, he, but a lot of churches, oh, yeah, well, you know. 
in about the year 90, the Holy Spirit stopped working and he hasn't done anything since then. I say, really? Well, what's he been doing? Oh, nothing. <laughs> so the world doesn't know the Spirit, but he says they're going to know the Spirit because they're different from the world. Because they're following him, because they know him, because they've put their faith in him, because they've come to him, they know the Spirit because they're different than the rest of the world. So he says, you know the Spirit. Now, if you were one of those guys, you'd have said, well, first of all, I don't even know what he's talking about because I don't even know what the Spirit business is. You know, like in the book of Acts, they say, were you guys baptized in the Holy Spirit? And they say, we don't even know what the Holy Spirit is. You know, it wasn't something that was obvious, but he says, if you really know him, you're different than the world and you understand that he's the spirit of truth. And you know that he's in the, that he, meaning Jesus, is in the Father and that he is in us and that we are in him. So we have this Trinitarian connection with all three persons of the Godhead. We believe in Jesus. We follow him. We believe that we're our sins are forgiven by his blood. When we understand that, the Spirit comes and lives with us. The Spirit's sent by the Father. We know that the Father sends Jesus. Father also sends the Spirit. So we have a relationship with the Father. We have a relationship with the Son. And we have a relationship with the Spirit. So it's all Trinitarian. Yes, no, can I get an amen, Alan? Donna, good, excellent. <laughs> so we have a relationship with all three members of the Trinity, of course, because they're of the same substance, the same essence. You know, Jesus said, if you've, seen the, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father and I are one. So we know, we understand this, and so we're different than the world. If you think Yeshua was just a great philosopher and a good teacher, and he came to teach us how to live, you don't get all this. He was a great philosopher. <clears throat> he did come to teach us how to live. But that's the, not the main reason that he came. So, John 14, 25, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, and now he names them, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things <clears throat> and bring to your remembrance all things that I said. <clears throat> so what's he going to do? He's going to remind you of everything I said. I mean, you guys are pretty much a bunch of dopes. You're not going to remember. And even if they weren't dopes, <clears throat> you know, you have a conversation with somebody, and then a few years later you're thinking, now what was it that he said? You know, I didn't write it down at the time. I wish I had written it down. Well, he says, don't worry about that because the Spirit's going to remember, going to have you remember everything that I said, and he's going to teach you a little bit of stuff. Is he going to teach you like a few little things here and there? No, he's going to teach you all things. He's going to clarify. You know, Paul says not everybody, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. He teaches us everything. Jesus said, we can't put every scripture up. Yeshua says, the spirit isn't going to come and talk about himself. He's going to come and talk about me. He's going to talk about me. He's going to glorify me. He's not going to glorify himself. So the spirit's glorifying the son. The son's glorifying the father. The father's glorifying the son. You see how it's all... Trinitarian. Yes? No? All Trinitarian. So he's going to teach you all things. So Yeshua taught them while he was present. They had three years of this, you know, pretty pretty good Bible school, pretty good seminary. <laughs> I mean, they weren't the bright, sharpest knives in the drawer, but, you know, when you hang around with Yeshua for three years, I mean, something's got to rub off on you. But he says, another teacher is coming 
who's going to teach you everything, even remind you of what I told you. You know, later he's going to say, you know, you guys are going to be persecuted. And it's coming now again. You guys are going to be persecuted. They're going to drag you to synagogues. They're going to drag you to the courts. And he says, don't worry about what you're going to say for your defense. Because the Holy Spirit's going to tell you what to say. So when the police come in here and arrest us all and take us to some court, we don't have to sit and study about what we're going to say because he's going to tell us what we're going to say. So how cool is that? He's going to teach us all things. Another teacher is coming. And he's going to teach all truth. He's going to remind them of what Jesus said. Because let's face it. When he gives them the Great Commission, he knows that those guys can't do it. Their track record hasn't been really good. He doesn't divide them up and say, okay, you guys go over there. You four guys go over there. You three guys go over there. He says, don't go anywhere. You stay here until you're clothed with power. Until the promise of my Father comes. This is the promise of the Father. Once I'm glorified, and you know, ye yesterday was actually the day of the ascension, 40 days after resurrection. Once he goes back to the glory that he came from, then the Spirit can come. That's why he says, in a very few days, the power is going to come on you. And this is the promise of the Father. So the Spirit sent in Jesus' name by the Father. The Son testifies of the Father. He always talks about the Father. He even says the Father is greater than I. We won't get into that. We've talked about that before. I say what the Father tells me to say. I do what I see the Father doing. The Spirit's going to come. He's not going to talk about himself. He's going to talk about me. I'm talking about my Father. My Father comes in audible form and glorifies me, the Spirit's going to glorify both of us. So the word Trinity is never mentioned, but it's all there. Yes, no. Uh, and this, well, let's see what comes on. John 15, but when the helper comes, this is the following chapter, still talking about the helper, the paraclete. When the paraclete comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Pentecost morning, when this, we'll talk about this next week, when this great outpouring of the spirit comes upon the 120 people in the upper room, and they went out and started preaching, did they go out and preach about the Holy Spirit? No, they went out and preached about Jesus. It was all about getting them to understand the gospel understand the scriptural basis of the gospel, and then to go out and start evangelizing. And Peter goes out and does this beautiful, I don't even want to call it a sermon. It was just a beautiful, powerful teaching. And the guy didn't know anything. But he quotes from Psalms, from prophets, and he puts together this beautiful thing, no PowerPoint. He didn't spend a week studying the scrolls and making notes. He just went outside and started to talk, and 3,000 people got saved. This is the mirror image of when the golden calf was made, and 3,000 people had their throats cut for this gross idolatry. On Pentecost morning, 3,000 people are saved. Isn't that cool? Mirror image. So he, the Spirit's going to testify of him. So he talks about the Spirit is a distinct person. He's not some symbolic force. He's not like some cosmic force like, you know, the Star Wars movies. He's a distinct person. You know, Paul and David both say the Spirit can be grieved. The Spirit is a person. He can be grieved. Jesus says, if you blaspheme the Father or you blaspheme the Son, you'll be forgiven. If you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you will never be forgiven. It's the unforgivable sin. He's a distinct person, 
but in the Godhead of the same essence, of the same substance. And so the Son intercedes to send them, not just then, but through all of Christian history. For 2,000 years, the Spirit has been doing things on earth. That's why we're here. We didn't just get up one morning and say, you know what, I got this figured out. Jesus is the Messiah. He died for me. His blood pays for my sin. Cool, I'm in. No, the Holy Spirit shows you that. It's been going on just like it happened here. It's been still going on today, right down to the very time when Jesus comes back, which I hope is tonight, right to when he comes back. It's still going to be going on because this is the plan. The Spirit shows you the truth. The Spirit points to the cross. The Spirit doesn't come and say, you know, let's see, we won't use anybody's name. You know, Ralph, you're such an awesome guy that, you know, I've accepted you just the way you are because you're so cool. And I love the way you have so much self-esteem. And I love how smart you are. And you're doing such a great job at work. And I'm really happy you took your kids to Cedar Point last week. That was really nice. No, he comes and shows you that you're a hopeless sinner and you stand condemned. And this is your solution. This is your remedy. This is your only salvation. Nobody else can save you. You know, John and Grace and Ron can say, we're just going to pray for Phil for the rest of his life. And that's not going to get me saved. It's good that they pray for me and through their intercession, maybe I'll the Spirit will come down on me, but they can't save me. People say, oh, nothing more important than family. That's the most ridiculous statement that there is. Your family can't save you. What if your family disowns you because you're a believer? Do you say, oh, family's the most important thing. I better forget about this Jesus stuff. No, he's the most important thing. And the spirit of truth shows you that for 2,000 years. The spirit testifies of him. So he's going to be the, he's the witness that this is all true. What about Paul? What about 2 Timothy 3.16? Read that for your homework too. Everybody write it down. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired. The Greek means it's breathed out. You know, creation is spoken into existence. You know, creation wasn't a quiet thing. Let there be, let, let this happen, let that happen. David writes in the Psalms, I think it's 104, 104. David writes that by his breath, everything was created. Well, we already learned that the word ruach means spirit, means breath, and means wind. The New Testament's written in Greek, right? Not in Hebrew, it's written in Greek. What's so cool about that? Well, because the Greek word panuma means spirit, it means wind, and it means breath. So God's breath created everything. So that's why he's called the giver of life, the creator of life, the prime mover. He regenerates. You can't regenerate yourself. You can make yourself a little better, but you can't regenerate yourself. So he's going to be a witness of what Jesus did. First John, John's first letter, not the Gospel of John, his first letter. And it is the Spirit who bears witness. Because he tells you. He tells you that this is true. He shows you where salvation is. It's not recycling your pop cans. It's not controlling your carbon emissions. Those things may be good to do, I don't know. But they're not going to save you. 
And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. This is our young friend John, while well, he's older when he's writing this. He was 16, probably, at the Last Supper. He was an apostle. He was the youngest one by far. <clears throat> so, remember in the Torah, you need two or three witnesses to confirm something. If I see Jordan commit a crime, which he would never do, but if I see Jordan commit a crime, and he said, a trial, and I go and I say, yep, I saw him do it. Anybody else? Nope, you're free to go. But if two or three other, a couple other people come forward and say, yes, I saw him do it, then he's convicted. Two or three witnesses. So he says there's three witnesses in heaven. The Father, the Word, the Logos, who's Yeshua, Jesus, right? John always calls Jesus the Word, the Logos in Greek. Read John's first chapter of his gospel and it'll blow you away. He calls him the Word. The Word in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. Logos. <clears throat> three witnesses, and these three are one. You know, Jesus says, you know, if I just talk about something myself, you know, you may believe it or you may not, but I got other witnesses. <clears throat> John 16, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For I do not. if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. You know, they were sad he was going to leave. You know, when he said, well, pretty soon you won't see me anymore. They're like, whoa, what do you mean? We're just kind of getting into this now. Oh, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to kill me. And wait, wait a minute. We mean kill you. I thought you were the Messiah. I thought you were going to be the king. I thought you were going to set up the kingdom. Well, they're going to kill me. I'm going to rise. Then after the resurrection, pretty soon you won't see me anymore. Oh, but he says, it's to your advantage that I go, because then you're going to do greater things than I did. Remember when he tells him, you'll do greater things than I did. That dopey bunch of guys are thinking, what do you mean? We're going to heal people? Yeah, they did. We're going to multiply food? Yeah, they did. We're going to raise people from the dead? Yeah, well, they did. We're going to pray in tongues and people are going to understand it? Yeah, they did. So they're going to do greater things. So when I depart, I'm going to send him to you. And when he has come, this is awesome, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. What's the, the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, and he tells us what the sin is that he convicts you of. You didn't believe in him. He didn't say, you stole $10 once. Oh, yeah. When you were 25, you did this. You took some money from your company. Yeah, I got all that. You committed adultery twice. Yeah, I got all that. He'll bring those things to mind. But Jesus says the sin he convicts you of is that you don't believe in me. And why is that the greatest sin? Because then you're damned. And it doesn't matter how good you are, how nice you are, how many times you go to church, how many prayers you say, how many candles you light, where you stand when you say the prayer, what you're wearing when you go. Those things are, you know, have some meaning, you know. But if you don't believe in him, you're convicted already. Remember when Jesus says, if you, if you, if you don't believe in me, you're already condemned. So this is what he's going to convict you of. And it says he's going to convict the world of sin. He doesn't say the Jews. He doesn't say just the Israelites. 
he doesn't say just the people living like within 100 miles of here. You're going to convict the world of sin, Jew and Gentile, everyone. Everyone is going to be one in Messiah. <laughs> what a catchy name. Everyone is going to be one in Messiah because the whole world is going to be affected by this. You know, when Jesus does the talk about the good shepherd, I think I just did that, did I? On the radio, I think, a couple of weeks ago. But anyway, you can look it up on the podcast. You know, he says, I've got flocks you guys don't know about. You know, he's talking about us. He doesn't say, all, all my sheep live right here. Y'all are my sheep. Those people over there. He says, I got flocks that you guys don't know about. There's people living in Europe and in Africa and in Asia and in the New World and that everywhere. There are my sheep too. So the whole world is going to be convicted, Jew and Gentile. And the biggest problem is whether they believe in Jesus or not. Because that's your righteousness, and it comes from the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21, remember, that's the only verse I want you to memorize. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There's no other way that you can be righteous. You can be relatively righteous. You could say, well, compared to that guy, huh, I'm like Mother Teresa. Or you can say, oh, compared to that guy, huh, I'm like St. Francis. Or compared to that guy, oh, I'm, I'm way better even than yeah, maybe you're relatively better, but your righteousness is in him. And this is what the Holy Spirit's going to show you, Jew and Gentile alike. Because he's going to go to the Father. He's going to sit at the right hand, and we're not going to physically see him anymore. He's not going to walk with us in a physical form and teach like he did on the mount, teach like he did, you know, in his by the sea. But he's at the right hand of the Father, but the Spirit comes to give proof of who he is and what he did. He's going to teach you all truth. Not some truth, a little bit of truth, all truth. And this is, this is good. I, I would have loved to see their faces when he said this. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. <laughs> However, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So you can't know all these things, but when the spirit comes, like next weekend, you're going to, he's going to teach you these things. He's, he's going to be sent to show you these things. And he's even going to tell you what are the things to come. Prophecy. You know, prophecy, of course, is through the Holy Spirit. We have a lot of false prophets in the world today because there's people who call themselves prophets. and There's people who call themselves apostles. And we won't get into that, but. There's a lot of bizarre stuff going on. And for the most part, every single person I've seen on Christian TV who calls himself a prophet has been wrong. Every single one. Now, if you remember back, we did it here, Deuteronomy chapter 18. God says, if somebody says they're a prophet and they come and they say, thus says the Lord, and I didn't say that, you have to take them out and stone them. Now, I'm not suggesting we could take these people out and stone them, but we have to be very careful to discern when somebody says, well, on June 28th at 2 p.m., this is going to happen. Well, if it does happen, then you can say, woo. But if it doesn't happen, most likely he's a false prophet. Of course, they never say what time zone, whether it's Eastern time, Pacific time. <laughs> woo. So he'll tell you of things to come. Uh-oh. Here we go. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. 
He's going to tell you about me. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said, he will take of mine and declare it to you. So I have everything that the Father has. When the Spirit comes, he's going to take all my things, and he's going to declare them to you. So this isn't like just some little, you know, charismatic experience that these guys are going to have. This is going to be a powerful outpouring. And if you haven't been to charismatic events, if you haven't had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you haven't felt his power manifest in you, you're really missing a lot. Woo. <clears throat> he knew they couldn't understand this. And they couldn't, he says, you guys can't cope with any more information. You know, sometimes you just have too much information. So, but when he comes, he's going to guide you, you know, like the cloud in the wilderness. You know what they do in the wilderness? The presence of God was there in the Shekinah cloud, the glory cloud. And when the cloud lifted and started to move, they packed up the camp. That was going to be yesterday's lesson, but we didn't have it. And in a certain order, the sanctuary gets packed up. Judah starts to move. I forgot the second one was. There's a whole order of the tribes moving. The ark stays in the middle, so it's protected. And then when the cloud stops, they set the camp up again in reverse order. So the cloud is guiding them through the wilderness like the Ruach, the Holy Spirit's guiding us through our lives. He moves, and you say, well, I have to go where he is. He stops, says, I have to stop here. Sometimes they were in a camp for a few days. Sometimes they were in a camp for a few months. At the base of Mount Sinai, they were there for 14 months, I think. That was 14 months. So he leads them somewhere and determines what they're going to do there and how long they're going to stay, just like he does with us today. When we were doing missions in Mexico, you know, I, I, I loved it so much that I was like this crazy guy who was the, as the plane was approaching the Mexico City airport, I would have my face to the window going, whoa, we're going to land. And oh, there's such and such a plane. And there's that. Oh, I'd be so excited. And then on trip 27, when I was putting my shoes on one morning to go back into this garbage area that we worked in, the Lord said to me, your time in Mexico is over now and something new is going to be. And I said, no, no, Lord, you don't understand. I love coming here. I don't think you get this. I love coming here. So I did two more trips. Everything was wrong. So I got the message. It's time to turn it over to Jim Murphy and go on with it. <laughs> you guys don't know Jim Murphy, but you guys do. So guide him in the wilderness. Guide to all truth, which includes the scripture. The scripture is all truth. Please read it. Please. I, I, I can't even, I, I don't even understand it. Why people don't want to, I just don't understand it. There isn't anything like it. And there never will be anything like it. So they'll be able to handle and understand it better. So since the Holy Spirit wrote all the scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, this is what he's going to guide them into. They're going to understand it. They went every Saturday morning, heard the readings. Now they say, oh, now I get it. Like when I started studying Torah years ago, all of a sudden, wow, it's talking about Jesus. Wow, this is about him. Wow, look at this. This is just like, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Because he shows you. And, you know, he, he takes you into all truth. And, you know, you have to understand, too, that you have an intimate knowledge of these things. The Holy Spirit doesn't take you off on some tangent that isn't important. If you feel the Holy Spirit's leading you to be, I don't know, some weird thing in some weird place, it's probably not him. 
because there's lots of voices competing for your attention. So, they'd be better able to explain and defend the truth because the Spirit doesn't come to teach anything different than is already in the Scripture. He doesn't come to teach anything different than what Jesus said. He doesn't come to teach anything different than what these people knew in their Scripture. And what's the only Scripture they had? The Tanakh, the Old Testament. You know, when Paul was in Berea, right over here, when Paul was in Berea and they said, we're going to check everything you say against the Scripture, he doesn't say, oh, no, wait a minute. That's going to make me nervous. He says, go ahead. What's the only Scripture they had? The Old Testament, the Tanakh. And they checked to make sure everything he was saying was right, and it was. And he's telling them about Jesus. Do you think the Torah class is fun or do you think it's boring? No, I think they say it's fun. Hey, pretty soon you'll just, just be able to watch it all of it online. So far, you can only watch 24 out of the 33 sessions. But. <clears throat> so it's, it's all consistent because the eternal word is always consistent. God doesn't change his mind. You know, there's, the church today says, well, God's changed his mind. He doesn't believe that stuff anymore. You know, you guys better get with it. We can't believe things we believed 2,000 years ago because, come on, man. We've evolved. We, we know more stuff. We're trying to be better people. <clears throat> and I love 1 Corinthians 2.10, and then we're going to stop, whether it's done or not. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. You know, the old translations like the King James say, the spirit plums the depths of God. That is so cool. It's like the spirit goes through the depth of God. He's the only one that can understand everything that God even is. All the understanding comes from the Spirit. And he's the one who's going to be poured out next week. How can we even stand that? And in Joel chapter 2, which we're going to talk about next week too, it says that at the end time, the Spirit's going to be poured out on all flesh. Different ages, different economic groups, male, female, it's not going to matter. Spirit's going to be poured out on all flesh. And you're going to have visions, you're going to dream dreams, and you're going to understand what the truth is. I like that. And what's he, what happens as a result? He comes to build up the body, advance the kingdom, and prepare the bride. We're the bride that's being prepared. We're going to be presented as a pure and spotless bride pretty soon. I hope it's tonight, but it's going to be soon. If we're still standing here 10 years ago, say, 10 years from now saying that, I'll be like, oh, I can't believe it has. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, I'll have to turn everything over to Jordan and have him go with it. <laughs> so next week is going to be the day. We're going to talk about the actual outpouring. You're going to hear about it if you go to church, hopefully. And you're going to learn how that outpouring changed humanity and how that outpouring still is changing humanity. Because we can't make ourselves good and we can't make ourselves better people and we can't make ourselves holy unless we do it this way. Whew. So next Friday here, same place. So let's close with the blessing, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we're going to do next week. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. 
give you his true shalom, a peace that surpasses all understanding, that brings the life in abundance. Because we know the power of the Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, and we pray in his name. Amen.